From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X Minus One. If you wanted to take over our world with a minimum amount of resistance and trouble, how would you go about it? Tonight we'll tell you how, with a strange and chilling story by George Lefferts, The Parade. You are Mr. Sid Ryan. The same. My name is Lou Char. I am a Martian. Ah, pleased to meet you, Mr. Lou. Uh... What was that again? A Martian. As in Orson Welles? Precisely. <laughs> I'm a Rotarian myself. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Lucha, what can Publicity Associates do for you? I am interested in obtaining publicity. It has been my observation that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lucha. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client. The client, of course, will be the Martians. You don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Luchar. Oh, how do you Mr. do... Mr. Luchar claims to be a Martian. Take him outside, will you, Oliver? I am happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I guessed it would. I believe we can do business. I have here cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand... Oliver, take a look at that wad of lettuce. It's the real stuff, Mr. Ryan. And my client is prepared to spend many times that amount. Oh, sit down, Mr. Lucha. Oliver, get the client a cigar, the 50-cent box. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign. A very large and important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Something quite new. Now... What would you judge the most effective type of campaign? Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying, Watch this space. Then, about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Then, finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. Excellent. We will conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire and the whole campaign is kafloppo. Quite so, quite so. The utmost secrecy. Ah, uh, you realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would, say, one million dollars cover expense? Hey, come again? I said, would one million dollars cover it? Why, yes, I am at... You did say, uh, a million. I understood that you have handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... No, no, not all, not all, I... As a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, oh, oh of course, that's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right. Mm. Yes, sir. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, the streetcars with a very simple statement. Yeah, uh, what's that? I will write it on a card. Here you are. The... Martians are coming. Say, that's not a bad teaser. Got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. The next ad will read, June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. Uh, what happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the Macy Parade? Exactly. Except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow, the Martian world. My client would like it to be a gay affair, balloons, clowns, pennants... Pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Luchard, just uh, what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? Oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy, remember? Yeah, but after all... Mr. I... Ryan, all will be revealed to you in good time. For the moment... 
Let us say that we are selling a concept. A concept? The concept of invasion from Mars. Sorrel Talent Agency. Uh, Sammy Sorrel, please. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Sammy, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine, I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40, June 1st. And listen, Sammy, I want them dressed in little space suits. In little... Uh, you, you know, like men from Mars. Mars. Okay? And I want some movie extras, uh, maybe 50 of them. 50. Also 50. rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome. Got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with pretty girls on top of them. Uh-huh. Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the one we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. Yeah, I'll try, Sid. Never mind the expense. Just get me the talent. It sounds like you landed a big client there. Who is it? <laughs> it's a secret. I got to hang now. Call me back, Sammy. Right. Uh, how you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan. Just fine. I got a hundred small boys pasted in little stickers. The Martians are coming on the subway platform. Good. We got full-page ads in all the dailies. Good. And ten-second spot announcements on every local station. Good. It's costing a fortune. Good. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you were going to the electric chair, Oliver. Yes, sir. How are you making out in the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Bonham invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbals, and Sacks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them. And funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. Well, that sounds fine, only... Uh... Only what? Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. Oliver, my boy. Do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not putting two and two together? You mean, you know who Luchar represents? Just by accident, understand. I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. One of those expensive pictures they make in secret and then spring on the public because they don't want the other studios to get the jump on them. What's the picture? A space opera titled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh. Oh, I begin to see. Also, by mere coincidence, it's supposed to have its premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? Yes, but... uh... Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Features Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no, so they have to get around the contract. A man named Lucha, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. (laughs) Need I go further? I don't know, Mr. Ryan. Sounds pretty far-fetched to me, but I don't know. That's what I like about you, Oliver. You're so innocent. Now, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello. Commish, Sid Ryan. Oh. How are you, Ryan? Fine. What is it this time? If you want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water, the answer is no. <laughs> also, we're not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade. June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Now, look, Ryan, I... Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the wearing of the green. Oh, don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. I have the 5th Avenue Merchants Association behind me. <sighs> okay. Fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. By the way, what's the occasion for this parade? Well, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. How is the campaign going, Mr. Ryan? Like wildfire, Mr. Lucha, like wildfire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I got some of the merchants doing World of Tomorrow displays in their windows. Every big novelty manufacturer in town is climbing on the bandwagon. They want to get into the parade with floats, giveaways, anything. Everybody smells a buck to be made. I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor himself declared Martian Day. I've even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the policeman's benevolent fund from the man from Mars. Oh, it's terrific, terrific. My blood pressure's up to 200. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, uh, I understand Century Pictures spent over a million bucks making that space opera. I beg pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucha. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? <laughs> Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. Hi! Hey! Hey, Michael! 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 Hey,
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Daly speaking to you from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York, a perfect day for a parade. And the streets are packed with thousands of spectators all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of shrill expectancy. Some of the kids and their parents have been camped on the curbstone since early this morning to be sure of ringside seats when the so-called Martians pass by. I've, uh, I've just had word from Saul Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, now while we're waiting for the arrival of the parade, we brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this most spectacular of all publicity stunts. That's right. Come on. Uh, what's your name, madam? Uh, Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. Uh huh. And where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Columbus, Ohio. I see. And I, I see you have your family with you too. Uh, two little curly-headed blonde boys. Uh, are you in New York on vacation? We came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Uh, well, uh, what do you think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here two hours. I, I can't make head or tail of it. Well, uh, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley. But judging by the thousands here today, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, folks say. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. Mr. Ryan's here. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Ryan, Ryan. Right. Right. And uh, this is Mr. Sid Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity man who's the brains behind the Martian Day stunt. Hello, Sid. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, easy, easy. Not so close to the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Sid, you've certainly lifted the lid this time. Looks like it, doesn't it? Sid, there's been a great deal of speculation as to exactly what all this is leading up to. I've heard some folks say it's a big war bond drive, uh, Others think it's just to stimulate local business. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand in the trade itself, the smart, smart money says you're building for the premiere of Century's forthcoming extravaganza, Invasion from Mars. Now, come clean. Can you tell us what the real story is? Ah, uh, I can. I'd like to, but honestly, I can't. Oh, man of mystery, eh? Are you going to watch the parade from the stand here? No, I can't. I can't stand noise. I'm going out to my office and watching <laughs> comfort. Well, thank you, Sid Ryan. And good luck. And here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade, swinging down Fifth Avenue with fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the traffics of a Mardi Gras. of little midgets in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits carrying Lou Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. Let's see, I, I can read one which says Atomic Blaster. <laughs> Another one has a placard reading We're, uh, we're Martian through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of the great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. This is promised as the climax of the show. Now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. And now here they come, ladies and gentlemen, the Martians, marching in booted, helmeted ranks, row after row of them. My, this is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen. And a rather serious contrast to the rest of the joyous slapstick parade we've witnessed. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each is holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position. They're marching in absolute silence, 
keeping step perfectly, as though some mute, unspoken command were marking time for them. The, the crowd seems rather grim and serious now. Perhaps they're reminded of the actuality of war and possible invasion. They stand solemnly, silently, watching. Even the children are awed. And now the first ranks of the Martians are moving past us, down Fifth Avenue toward the reviewing stands at the square. No one moves. What's that? What's happening? Oh, there, a woman, a woman, ladies and gentlemen. She dashed out into the street. For what reason, I don't know. She attempted to lift the visor of one of the Martian spacesuits, but just as she reached the Martian, she fell forward in a dead faint. I tell you, I've never felt such mass tension in a crowd as we're experiencing here right now, today. All sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the audience. There are excited whispers of she's dead, she fainted, and now an undercurrent of... What? They're really Martians. This is an example of how a single incident can precipitate mass hysteria, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's a mighty reassuring sight to see the blue uniforms of New York's finest spaced every ten feet or so along the avenue. Somehow, I, I can't explain it, but this incident has begun to work on what was a moment ago a happy, carefree crowd, and the complexion is changing. Did you see that? A woman fainted. Of course I saw it. What do you suppose she saw? Oliver, old man, did I ever tell you you were too naive for this business? But that young woman ran out into the streets to get a close look at the Martians, and then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver, the stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. Yeah, for my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Uh, shut the window. Don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucha? I haven't seen him. Well, he'll be around. Boy, those Martians sure look like the real thing. How would you know the real thing if you saw it, Oliver? Well, gee, I, I don't know. Uh, close the window, Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan. Talent agency. Sammy, this is Sid Ryan. Say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. Oh, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Well, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in the bag? Never felt better. You mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, but Sid, under the circumstances... Sid. Well, what is it? Sid, don't you know? I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. I was going to call you, but I figured... Hey, wait a minute. I... Where'd these guys come from if you didn't hire them? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe Oliver... Oh, hold on. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? No, sir, I... Sammy, this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... Okay, Sammy, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. I just don't know. I've got to locate Lucha. What's Century Pictures number? Mr. Ryan, this is Sunday. Oh, yeah. Well, get me their publicity director, Marty Sanford, at home. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Here you are. Thanks. Sanford. Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the uh, Fine, fine. Uh, listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucha. Uh, Lou who? Lucha, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. I Invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you, Batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. Too expensive and too fantastic. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. And I never heard of a guy named Luke. Mother of heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. Well, that's too fantastic. What's too fantastic, Mr. Ryan? Is something wrong? Open that window. I want another look at those Martians. Yes, sir. Look at them. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that and say... 24 hours? Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one other step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. 
The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi storm troops marching through the streets of Paris. See those chests on That's pride. Sheer, arrogant pride. Look at those chins. That's contempt. Nobody could act like that. Mr. Ryan! Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who fainted. Her name's Gloria Montex. Get her up here. Make it fast. I can't get much sense out of her. Stay away from me. Gloria, it's me, Sid Ryan. Oh, don't kid me. You're a Martian. Gloria, settle down. Now you're wearing a mask. Baby, it's me, Sid. And underneath, it's, it's awful. It's all big green eyes and those, those feelings like, like a captive. Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you about the fainting. That wasn't in the end. Oh, go away, please. Go away. What'd you see? Oh, no, please. It's too awful. Please, please. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what'd you see? You won't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver, I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. We gotta stop this parade before things begin to happen. Okay, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. You gotta stop that parade. Uh, I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front page spread on every paper in town. Honest, you publicity guys give me a pay. This may be a matter of life and death. Oh, sure, sure. Look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where these Martians came from, who they are, anything about them. All I want you to do is stop the parade and make sure they're on the level. Uh Uh-uh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. Now, if you let the sergeant show you out... You won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection and you refuse it. I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than a fried egg. Go ahead. I'm sure his honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. You heard me, Ryan. You cannot see the mayor. Adolph, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guy, something horrible is already happening. A couple hundred little kids are in the hospital with tomaine poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. Or didn't you know? I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure, sure, you'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people would get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space that would get you and your product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. You won't have to because you're going to get out of here right now. Go on, beat it, get out. You and your publicity stunts make me sick to my stomach. Oliver? Oliver, where are you? Uh, Oliver? Oliver! It is useless what? to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucha. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him? You stinking murderer. Now, now Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled, now would it? Lucha, start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? But surely you know, Mr. Ryan, after all, you've been publicizing it for months. Listen, you... Please do not interrupt. You see, before colonizing your planet, we Martians sent advanced scouts to study your habits, your weaknesses. We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity, and so... We conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. Clever, huh? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plan? Holy jumping catfish. You've done very well. Then there was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is... Death. What are you trying to do, Lucha? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundreds would suffice. In exactly two minutes, our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucha. But not if I can help it. You... 
Go ahead. Yes, please. Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry! Reviewing stand, Sergeant Cassidy. Get me Commissioner Patrick. Hello. 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 Uh, you'll have to talk loud. I want Commissioner Patrick. Oh. Patrick, Patrick! Oh, wait, wait a minute. Th things are quieting down. Uh, now, what was it you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to what? him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. What? Stop him! Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. You I... idiot, the worst is going on! This is the operator. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan, you've been cut off. I can't seem to get them back. Doesn't matter, operator. Nothing matters now. Tonight... X-1 has brought you The Parade, an original story written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Joe DeSantis as Luchar, Alexander Scorby as Daly, Agnes Young as The Woman, Ellen Deming as Gloria, John Thomas as Oliver, Arthur Anderson as Sammy, Wendell Holmes as The Commissioner, and William Keene as Sanford, your announcer Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and it's a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Next week, the tables turn. Instead of Martians invading Earth, we bring you a tale of men invading Mars, Ray Bradbury's brilliant short story entitled Mars is Heaven. Suppose you were a member of the first rocket ship crew to land on Mars, but instead of seeing Martians, you find that you've landed in a town that looks just like home, that all your dead relatives and friends are there to greet you, so that as incredible as it may seem, you think you're really in heaven. That is, you think so, right up to the fatal moment, the moment of X minus one. Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. The Mysterious Traveler. Another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? You'll find out when we get there. I hope it's not making you nervous being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds. For the things that happen at night are sometimes most upsetting. Things such as cats that vanish or die. As in the tale of The House of Death. Living out in the country this way, Louise. We're so isolated from everyone. Yes, Martha. It was much nicer when we lived in our own house in the village. And even if Roger and Hester are our nephew and niece, we should never have let them persuade us to move out here with them. Mm. Oh, doesn't that wind ever stop blowing? Oh, Martha, Roger and Hester are coming. I, I, I just saw the car turn into the drive. Well, I hope they've brought a maid. Well, what's the matter with Toby and Queenie? Oh, mother's little darling's hungry. Mm. Even Toby and Queenie don't like living here. Yes, they, they do seem unhappy. But Toby hasn't been eating well at all. Oh, Louise is very foolish out living here with Roger and Hester. I think we should move back to our house in the village where we can really be happy. Oh, Martha, could we? I see no reason why we can't. 
So much nonsense about our being invalids and too old to live alone. Hello, Aunt Martha. Aunt Louise. Oh, Roger. Were you able to get a maid for it? Oh, I'm sorry about that, Aunt Louise. I tried, but it's just impossible to get a maid these days. But Roger, you know we need someone to push Louise around in her wheelchair. It's too much for me. Well, I'm sure Hester will do anything you ask. How are you, Aunt Louise? Aunt Martha? I brought you some good hot tea and some biscuits. Thank you, dear. Uh, Roger, uh, Louise and I have been talking things over. Now, it is very kind of Hester and you to invite us to live with you, but we were much happier living in the village and would like to go back to our house. What? But, Aunt Martha, it's much better for you here. Why, of course. You're homesick, that's all. Why, certainly. In time, you'll come to love this place as we do. Now, we don't want to hear another word about your leaving. We couldn't be happy thinking of the two of you living alone in that house in the village. Come along, Roger. Let them drink their tea. Yes, Hester. Well, see you both later. They're really so good to us, Martha. But I, I do wish they'd let us return to our own house. Mm. Tea tastes strange. Mm? Have you tried it, Jeff Louise? No. Well, yes, you're right. It, it, it does taste funny. Probably the water they use. Nothing out here seems as good as it was home. You'd better not drink any more of it. No, oh, do you remember the little teas we used to give when we lived in the village? Mary Thompson came over every afternoon. It was so nice. Mm, there's no reason why we can't move back to our house and have those teas again. But you heard what Roger and Hester said. Our health isn't so good and we need someone to look after us. Well, what of it? All that money Father left us, we can afford a dozen servants. Yes, Louise, I think we'd better plan to return home. The mail car in sight, Louise? No, Martha, not yet. You know, I've been thinking quite a bit these past 24 hours about returning home, and I think we'll leave here in a few days. Oh, Martha, that would be wonderful. Oh, look, here, here comes George Gibson now with the mail. Oh, and that time, too. Yes. Uh, uh, how would that to be a beautiful queenie like to go back to their own little home? Oh, Martha, they understand perfectly what you're saying. Look how happy they are. <laughs> Good they do. Oh, Aunt Martha, oh. Aunt Louise. George Gibson just delivered the Sentinel. Oh, Here thank, you are. Thank you, Roger. We've been waiting all day for you. Oh, that's all right, Aunt Louise. Hester will soon bring you your supper. Uh, now, let's see. Oh, Martha, let's look at the obituary notices first. That's just what I was turning to, Louise. <sighs> ah, here we are. Did anybody we know die? Mm, now, let me see. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. You remember Amos Wilson, don't you? Yes. He died two days ago. Poor Amos. He was about your age, wasn't he, Martha? Certainly not. He was a good deal older. <gasps> Martha, look at this. Hmm? Why, it says that Mary Thompson is entering the home for the infirm. The poor house? Oh, no, it can't be. Oh, the dreadful place. I'd sooner be dead than in that home. Poor Mary. Oh, I shudder every time I think of that horrible place. The poor house. Martha, after we move back to the village, can't we have Mary come to live with us? But yes, of course. Going to the poor house would be the death of her. Oh. Huh? Louise, what are you staring at in this paper? No. No, it can't be. What can't be? Read what it says in the real estate column. Hmm? The old Abbott mansion, owned by the Mrs. Martha and Louise Abbott, has been put up for sale by their nephew, Roger Abbott. What? What a ah. mistake. We never told Roger to sell our house. I wouldn't dream of it. Why, Martha, it's been in the family for almost a century. How could Roger do such a thing? I'll soon find out. Roger. Roger. Now, Martha, you, you mustn't get excited. But why should he want to sell our house? Are you calling me up, Martha? Yes, Roger. What's this in the Sentinel about our house being for sale? Oh, is it in the Sentinel? Oh, I'm sorry. It is a mistake, isn't it, Roger? No, Aunt Louise. Oh. You see, as co-trustee of Grandfather's estate, I thought it would be a good idea to sell the house. 
Prices are high these days, and the house is rather old. But you have no right to put the house up for sale without telling me. I won't hear of the house being sold. Now, you mustn't get excited, Aunt Martha. If you don't want the house sold, I'll remove it from the market. Oh, please do. We couldn't live in the house if it was sold, could all we, All right, Louise? all right. I'll take care of everything. Everything's going to be all right now. Oh, I don't like it, Louise. I don't like it at all. Why did he try to sell it without telling us? It, it does seem strange. Louise... We must get in touch with Judge Smith. Yes. He's the administrator of Father's estate. And he'll take care of everything for us in the way we want it. It isn't that I don't trust Roger, but you must recall the scrape he was in when he attended college. And then there was the matter of that bad check Roger gave. It hadn't been for his dear Shh. father, he was... Someone's coming, Martha. I have your supper for you. Now, please eat them before they get cold. Yes, yes, sir. There you are. Just call me if there's anything else you want. Yes, does Mother's beautiful queenie want something to eat? I don't see Toby any place around. Well, he's probably in the kitchen. Now, say pretty please, queenie, and Mother give you this nice piece of meat. <laughs> That's Mother's darling. Here you are. Oh, isn't she lovely, Louise? Oh, yes. Queenie has such wonderful manners. Uh, we'd better eat our soup before it gets cold, Martha. Yes. And as I was saying, Louise, I don't care for Roger's attitude at all. Ask me, he's been behaving very strangely. Yes, Martha. Martha. Hmm? Martha, that, that piece of meat you gave Queenie doesn't seem to have agreed with her. She looks ill. Oh, yes, you're right. Oh, Queenie, what's the matter with Mother's little oh, darling? Oh, Martha, she's in agony. Yes. What can we do? Oh, Roger, Roger, come quickly. Oh, poor Queenie. Roger. She's suffering so hard, oh, Martha. Oh, Roger, do something. We must help poor Queenie. Oh, Roger, look. I'm afraid it's too late, Aunt Martha. She's dead. Dead? But oh, she can't be. Oh. She was all right just a few oh. minutes ago. Things like this will happen, Aunt Martha. She was old. She probably had cramps. Roger, you better take Queenie out of here. All right, dear. Poor Queenie. We've had her ever since she was a little kitten. Twelve years now. There, there, Aunt Louise. You mustn't cry. You still have Toby. Now, why don't you eat your supper? You'll feel much better if you do. Yes, sir. How can you speak of food at a time like this? With poor Queenie's body not even cold. I'm sorry, Aunt Martha. If you want me, just call. Oh, Martha, it won't be the same without Queenie. I simply can't understand it. One minute Queenie was perfectly well. Then after you gave her the meat, she became ill. Yes, she was perfectly well until she ate the meat. Mm. Louise, the meat, that's it. Don't understand, Martha. The meat, it was poisoned. Poisoned? Louise, that poisoned meat was meant for us. Martha... You don't mean that Roger and Hester... Oh, no. Yes, no. Louise, they're after our money. Oh, what are we going to do? We, we, we can't get at the phone. We have to get in touch with Judge Smith. Oh. Our lives depend upon it. The two old ladies stared at each other, terror in their eyes. The minutes dragged into hours. And each hour was a nightmare as they waited for the time to come when they could make the one contact between themselves and the outside world. Do you see George Gibson's car yet, Martha? No, Louise, but he should be in sight any minute now. Oh, what if Hester or Roger come home before he gets here? Then we won't be able to talk to him about our message to Judge Smith. Now, Louise, you know Roger isn't due home from work for another hour. Yes, yes, but what about Hester? She's over at the Miller's farm, and she's liable to return any minute. Please, I see George Gibson's car. Oh. He's just turning oh, into hurry, the drive. Hurry, hurry, Martha, hurry. Oh, right, hurry. Please, hurry. The window. Oh, Martha, Martha, call to him quick before he gets away. Uh, George? George Gibson? Hello? Who's calling? Uh, look over this way, George. It's Martha Abbott. I want to see you. Oh, it's you, Martha. Well, howdy, I'm coming. He's coming, Louise, do you hear? Yes. Now we'll be able to get in touch with Judge Smith. But after George Gibson left the Abbott sisters, 
He met Hester a half mile up the road. The two conversed for a minute. Then George Gibson continued on his way. Hester stared after him as he drove away, her face tense and white. Then, as if suddenly understanding the implication of his words, she turned and ran towards her home, her heart pounding with fear. Roger! Roger, I just met George Gibson. And he told me that when he delivered the mail here, Aunt Martha and Aunt Louise called him into the house. Called him into the house? Yes. They asked him to get Judge Smith for them at once. I told you it wasn't safe to leave them alone, even with the phone locked in our room. All our plans may have been for nothing. Oh, Roger. Do you think they suspect? I don't know. But I do know it was a mistake letting them talk to George Gibson. After all our careful work, we can't let everything be spoiled now. <laughs> These past 24 hours have been endless. Where can George be? He's probably delayed somewhere. Oh, Martha, Martha, there. George is coming. He just turned into the drive. I told you he wouldn't fail us. Oh, but Roger and Hester are in the house now. What if they don't let George see us? Nonsense. When George has a message to deliver, he delivers it. I've just, just gone out to get the mail, but... Louise. What is it, Martha? What's wrong? That isn't George Gibson driving the mail car. What? The man driving it's only a youngster... Now he's leaving. Martha, what does it mean? I don't know. I don't understand. Perhaps George is ill and he, he couldn't come today. Hello, I'm Martha Louise. This magazine just came in the mail. Thought you might like to see it. Thank you, Roger. Why didn't George Gibson deliver the mail? Oh, so you noticed there was a new driver today? Yes. I'm sorry to tell you this, but poor George Gibson was killed last night. Killed? Oh, no. He had an accident as he was returning to the village. An accident? Yes. I don't want to speak any more about it. It'll just upset you. Hester will bring you your supper soon. Oh, poor George. That means Judge Smith never got our message. Oh, Martha. Louise, don't you see? It wasn't an accident. But Roger said it was. George it? was deliberately killed to keep him from going to Judge Smith. <gasps> Martha, you don't mean that Roger and yes, Hester... Louise. They won't stop at anything to get our money. Oh, Martha, I'm so frightened. Oh, we must have courage or we're lost. Oh, but if we can't get word to the outside and, and they're poisoning our food. Well, we haven't eaten a thing since poor Queenie died. We can't go on throwing food away or we'll starve. There's only one thing to do, Louise, if we're not to starve. Toby, must sample our food before we eat it. You mean to see if it's poisoned? Yes. Oh. Oh, I know it's dreadful risking poor Toby's life like that. But it's the only thing to do. And meanwhile, we must get in touch with Judge Smith. We must. You are, Toby, a nice piece of meat for Mother, little darling. Aunt uh, Martha? Why are you feeding Toby? He gets plenty to eat in the kitchen. Of course. I've always said Toby for my own plate. He expects it. But Aunt Martha, if you feed that meat to the cat, there won't be enough for you. Yes. If you're to get well, you need all that food. Now, I don't want you feeding Toby any more of it. Here, Toby. Come along, boy. Come on out to the kitchen while Aunt Martha and Louise eat their supper. What, Martha? Louise, I've brought you your lunch. Doesn't it look good? Yes, Hester, it's very nice. Lunch, eh? Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Hester, have you seen Toby? No, Aunt Martha, I haven't. Oh, but where could he be? Toby's always on time for meals. Well, he's probably someplace around the house. Oh. Now eat your lunch before it gets cold. Oh, Martha, where can he be? Toby will be along in a few minutes. We won't touch a bit of this food until he's tried it first. Oh, I do wish he were here. I'm so hungry. Louise, don't touch a thing on that tray. It isn't safe. Oh, here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. Well, 
Good evening, Aunt Martha. Louise, how are you? Good evening, Roger. I have your supper here for you, too. Aunt Martha, neither of you ate your lunch. What's wrong? We... we weren't hungry, Hester. Have you found Toby yet? No. I've looked everywhere for him, but he seems to have disappeared. Oh, no. Now, you mustn't worry. I'm sure he'll turn up. Yes. Aunt Martha, you and Louise can't afford to miss meals in your state of health. Why, certainly not. Now, we want you to eat everything that Hester has brought you. Yes, you'll make us very unhappy if you don't. Now, eat it while it's hot. Come along, Roger. I'll get you your supper. All right, dear. Did you hear what she said about Toby Louise? Yes, he's vanished. Nonsense. They've killed him. You saw how angry they were last night when we fed Toby from our plates. They've killed him so he won't spoil their plans. Oh, Martha, what are we going to do? I'm so hungry. Got to get word to Judge Smith before it's too late. But how? Tomorrow, I'm going to go out to the road and try to get to the village. But, Martha, it's, it's two miles to the village, and you know you can't walk more than a few yards. You, you're not strong enough. Louise, with either starvation or poisoning staring us in the face, we haven't any choice. I must try to reach the village. The next morning, after Roger had left for the village and Hester had gone to the Miller farm, Martha dressed as quickly as her shaking hands would permit. Louise watched nervously as her sister quietly opened the door and started on her long, painful way to the village. Hello, Aunt Louise. Oh, why, where's Aunt Martha? Uh, Aunt Martha? Uh, she's someplace around the house, but I've just been through the house. Why, her closet is open, and her hat and coat are missing. Aunt Louise, did Martha leave this house? Why, uh, oh, why yes, she, uh, she said she wanted to go for a walk. Go for a walk? At her age and in weather like this? Well, it'll be the death of her. Did she start out toward the village? Answer me. Hey, hey, yes, Hester. I'll phone Roger at his office. She must be stopped. Twenty minutes later, as Roger drove along the road leading to his home, he saw a small figure in the distance. It was Aunt Martha. There was a weary, painful look on her face as she hobbled towards the village. In spite of her determined resistance, he put her in his car and drove rapidly on home. One thought was uppermost in his mind. He must make sure that this could never be repeated. Oh, Martha, I'm so hungry. Yes, Louise, I know. So am I. We've gone three days now without eating. We left them our money and our wills. Why must they kill us? They're nothing but common murderers. Oh, if there was only some way to get word to the village. Louise, I've got an idea. What is it, Martha? If we were to set fire to the house, they'd see it in the village. Yes. And then, then the fire company would come out. Then we'd be able to tell them we'd be saved. Oh, oh but Martha... Hester and Roger would put out the fire before it could get big enough. Louise, I know a way we can prevent them from putting out the fire. You do? Yes, and we can save ourselves, Louise. We can save ourselves. Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Aunt Martha. Why are you looking down the cellar? You should be in your room. Yes, it's drafty out here in the hall. Now, come on, close the cellar door and go back to your room. But I heard Toby crying. He's down in the cellar, and I won't go to my room until I get but him. But Aunt Martha, Roger, he... just to put Aunt Martha's mind at ease, why don't you go down to the cellar and see if Toby is there? Oh, all right. If you ask me, it's just a waste of time. Oh, please help him look for Toby, Hester. You'll find him so much quicker if you both look for him. Oh, very well. But you go back to your room so you won't catch cold. Roger, do you see him? He doesn't seem to be any place here in the cellar. Now we'll see just how smart you are trying to poison us. There, he won't stop us from escaping now. Oh, I must get Louise. Louise! Louise! Yes, Mom. Oh, Louise, it worked. Martha, you mean you you were able to lock them in the cellar? Yes, and with the door locked, they can't get out. Oh. And Martha, unlock this door. 
Let us go. Oh, they found out they're locked in. Don't you worry about it, Louise. I'll take care of everything. Oh, Martha. And Martha. Martha, what are you doing with that kerosene lamp? I'm pouring the kerosene around the room so that it'll burn better. Oh, Are you ready to leave, Louise? Yes, Martha. Strike a match and start the fire. Please, Martha, please open the door. Oh, oh, how quickly it's starting to spread. Yes, we better leave. I'll push your wheelchair, Louise, and you try to help by rolling the wheels. Yes, Louise. There. Yes, we're coming along nicely. Oh, Martha, I hate to do this. Louise, you mustn't waste any pity on them. Even if they are our niece and nephew, they're nothing but common murderers. Yes, I suppose you're right. Now I'll just open the front door and we'll be free. Roll the wheels a bit, Louise. Yes, I am. Just a few feet more and we'll be safe. There. 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 Far enough away from the house to be perfectly safe. Oh, my. The whole house is on fire now. Yes, lovely fire, isn't it? I don't feel cold at all. Oh, do you think they can see it in the village by now, Martha? I'm sure they do. Remember, Louise, when the fire company gets here, we don't know what happened to Roger and Hester. We just managed to get out ourselves. Yes, Martha. If we told them what we were forced to do to escape, we'd have to reveal that our own niece and nephew were poisonous murderers. We don't want to disgrace the family name, Louise. Oh, no, Martha. Of course not. Oh, oh look, look, Martha, look. The roof is beginning to go. Two minutes later, the fire company arrived to find Martha and Louise in the garden, staring at the roaring fire which had been their home. It was too late to save the other occupants of the house, so the men were forced to stand by helplessly and watch it burn. Good morning, Judge Smith. Good morning, Miss Martha, Miss Louise. I trust you're well after that terrible ordeal last night. We're much better, thank you, Judge. Well, now that your niece and nephew are gone, we must plan for your future. Oh, you don't have to bother, Judge. All we want to do is move back to our old house, hire a few servants, and live as we used to. Oh, and I was wondering if you could arrange to have Mary Thompson come live with us. I won't hear of her going to that dreadful home for the infirm. Oh, no, it would be the death of her. Ladies, I'd hoped I'd never have to reveal the truth to you, but now it appears I must. I don't understand, Judge. Last month, the bonds in the trust fund your father left you became utterly worthless. What? Your nephew and niece were afraid the shock of learning you were penniless would kill you. So it was decided to keep the news from you. That's why the three of us persuaded you to move in with them. Your house here in the village had to be sold to meet debts of the estate. But that can't be. Father left us so much. It's all worthless now. Perhaps I should have told you this a month ago. But your niece and nephew wouldn't hear of it. In spite of the fact that they had only Roger's salary to live on, they were determined to prevent you from ever learning of your misfortune. But the... the deaths of poor Queenie and Toby. Of, of... of George Gibson. George Gibson? Yes. I'm afraid I don't understand. Surely you heard he was killed a few days ago when a tire on his car blew out and it overturned. You mean he wasn't murdered? Certainly not. Oh. Are you feeling well? Has my news been too much for you? No. No. Well, now that you're niece and nephew are gone and there's no one to support you. I'm afraid there's only one thing left. One thing left? What's that? I'm sorry to say the home for the infirm, the poor house. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? 
too bad about the Abbott sisters. Such nice old ladies. But then, how were they to know that poor Queenie died of cramps, not poison? After all, you can't be too careful, can you? Would you care for a sandwich? They're very delicious. I make them myself. Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week. You've just heard Chapter 9 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The House of Death, Irene Hubbard played Martha Abbott and Elizabeth Morgan played Louise Abbott. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Robert Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled, The Man Who Knew Too Much. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. Mutual.